Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the intelligent social media platform. And I'm back with our monthly installment with Dr. Jonathan Cook. And we're doing what we do a lot, which is to discuss the work of Herman Melville. And it was requested that we take on his novella, Benito Sereno, and um, or Benito Sereno, Benito, Benito Sereno. I think Sereno, I, I, yeah. I have it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, without further ado, let's get into it. Um, may, before may we start to analyze it, maybe we should share our impressions of the novella. Would Would you like to go first, Doctor Cook? What about this uh, text resonated with you? Yeah. Well. Um... It's a, it's a wonderful work, and it changes each time you read it. Uh, I think first-time readers um, think of it as uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, they might be misled to think that Melville has bought into the racial stereotypes that governed his era and, and still influence ours, you know. The idea that the blacks on this ship are all um, involved in some kind of masquerade, but they're they're all scheming evil villains, uh, led by this mastermind of villainy, Babo, uh, who is sort of partially modeled on Shakespeare's Iago, um, and people might be led to believe that this is just kind of a good adventure story about how this heroic American captain uh, went on board this derelict ship uh, uh, that was allegedly being skippered by this uh, Spanish character Benito Serino and uh, um, who was acting very strangely and it turns out was actually being victimized by the uh, slaves who had le- who had uh, performed an uprising a couple of months before and so that his recapture of the ship for Benito Serino um, was some kind of heroic deed uh, um, that suits you know our image of ourselves as liberators uh, for Americans but uh, I mean, the more you examine the story, the more complex it becomes, because it's it's obvious that Melville is not, I mean, if you know his work, you know Melville is not prone to racial stereotypes except to sort of question them or explode them. So um, you, you can really read the story from several points of view, but um, it, it still arouses questions about exactly what he was attempting to say, if there was a political message to it, if there was a religious message, um, you know, it's still up for grabs in, in many ways. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I myself am trying to formulate my own sort of individual take on the story, which, uh, you know, I usually approach things from, from Melba from a re- religious perspective. Uh, in this case, uh, it's harder to do because um, it's, uh, you know, there's no obvious religious allegory going on here, except that human nature is, has a potential for great evil, you know. And, and I sort of, having recently read uh, Heart of Darkness of Joseph Conrad, it seems as though there's some interesting parallels between the two of them as as sort of allegories of the journey to this place of evil and it could be in the heart of Africa in Conrad's story but you know it's set on the Thames which is deliberately uh, presented as a place where something comparable might have happened 2,000 years earlier when the Romans first went to Britain you know going up the Thames was sort of like going up the Congo River so it's it's sort of a, the evil at the heart of human nature um, would be one uh, you know theme that you could take away from the story in terms of Melville's religious outlook. And I I don't know what did you what what sort of ideas came to your mind reading at this time? 
Well, I have to say that, you know, this is the first time that I've articulated any of my thoughts on the text. So they're not going to be very mature thoughts. It did, they did evolve as time went along. I believe the first time I read it, I was a little bit confused about what was going on. And yeah. then I did some background research and it kind of all came together in my mind. I liked this text. It's very um, M. Night Shyamalan of, uh, of, of Herman Melville. I mean, there's this very dramatic plot twist yeah. that alters your entire perception yeah. of what's going on in the, in the narrative. And I like those sor sort of things. I like, I like uh, thinking about how perception shapes our reality and how something can be brought to our attention that shifts our complete understanding of the situation. And so I think the book is very effective in that way. And I think it raises a lot of interesting questions about how we live in denial, how we deny the reality of what's going on in our environs because it may be uncomfortable, because we don't want to be admit uncomfortable information into our understanding of a situation. And we, and we run great peril. We run to great peril doing that. So that's, I, that's why I like this text. Um, I see some religious aspects to it, which I think will come out in our conversation, like the name of the boat. I think it was yeah. called what the San Dominic. Um, yeah. uh, and that has obvious uh, um, monkish order uh, connections. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy, I in general, just where I am with the text is I enjoyed the dramatic plot twist of it. Yeah. Thinking it was going one way and then finding out it was going to go another way. Yeah. Uh, which we should, we should probably, I mean, everyone who's probably listening to this already knows. So maybe we want to spoil it for them. Yeah. I'm being, I'm being cryptic. You, you might do it better justice than me. Do you want to tell them? Well, do you want to summarize it for them? <laughs> well, the, I mean, I, I think it doesn't really matter if you know exactly what's coming up. You can appreciate the the twists and turns of um, Delano's perception, but um, he pretty much spends a whole day on the ship um, trying to figure out what's going on because it he is looking at a very distressing scene of blacks and whites kind of mingling together and uh, expressing their, um, uh, you know, the sense of misery and the fact that they've been out without water for days on end. And uh, at the same time, all the, the white sailors who are not very numerous are stationed at different places, the, the more conspicuous people on the ship are are these black slaves who are you know you have the hatchet polishers and you have the the huge giant atufal who comes out and makes a charade of um um being punished by uh sereno periodically and then you have babo who is the mastermind behind the slave uprising and is posing as benito sereno's valet and minder who is making sure that he doesn't tell uh, Delano exactly what is happening on the ship, which is that they're in the midst of a slave uprising and they want to use Delano to get more supplies and then later on attack his ship and um, use it to get more supplies and, and possibly facilitate their journey back to Africa, which is what their plan was originally. Uh, and all this is happening off the coast of Chile. The original ship uh, was supposed to be going from Valparaiso to Caleo in Peru, so it was going up the coast of South America. Um, and uh, the owner of the slaves is this guy, Don Alexander Arando, um, whose friend is Benito Serino, and he's the survivor of the original massacre of sailors uh, that led, uh, that was part of the uprising. But anyway, all of the mystery that Delano faces throughout the day um, suddenly becomes clear when his, sh one, uh, his longboat comes up to pick him up to take him back to his own ship, the Bachelor's Delight, and Serino leaps into the ship, or the, rather the longboat, um, escaping from the ship, and then 
Babo is there uh, jumping into the ship as well with a dagger in his hand to kill uh, Serino because he doesn't want him telling exactly what's going on. And of course, Delano stops Babo from attacking Serino. At first, he thinks that when Serino jumps on, that he's going to be attacking him. And then when Babo jumps on, he suddenly realizes the whole situation. So it's kind of a, a extremely dramatic um, situation where the scales drop from his eyes. I mean, it's that image of St. Paul, uh, St. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. You know, he suddenly had his conversion experience. And here, the conversion, the enlightenment is to the um, the, the evil of the situation that he has been miraculously protected from. Um, and then, uh, but it's interesting, when the story was published, it came out in three installments in Putnam's Magazine in uh, October, November, December, 1855. And um, the two and first two installments pretty much ended just before the discovery of the truth by Delano. So the readers had two issues to read all about Delano's uh, ponderings about what was going on on the ship and all the little incidents that he has to decipher and the famous shaving scene. And then it was finally in the third uh, installment that they would discover what was going on and then they would read in the legal documents the history of exactly what went on, you know, in this very dry statistical um, deposition from Benito Serino that serves as a court record to uh, deal with all the legal issues, you know, from from this incident. So... Yeah, it's amazing. The shaving scene... Yeah, you mentioned about how the scales come off your eyes and how you see it from one perspective and it seems sort of uh, strange but innocuous and then it suddenly turns... it When you look at it from another perspective... Yeah. Um, just how high the stakes were at that particular moment, how things could have gone sideways. Yeah. Well, very it's dramatically. That, that it's instant. interesting that, uh, you know, at the end of the story, Benito Serino says uh, he has this very grateful attitude towards uh, Amasa Delano for basically saving him from death um, or who knows what else that would be worse. And he, uh, he says, your innocence was instrumental in keeping you from harm when you were walking around the ship. In other words, the fact that you didn't suspect anything was kind of a, created a sort of magical halo around you so that no one could really attack you. And at the same time, people who read the story today and who've read the story in the past think of Delano as a, a naive American who is... Um, uneducated in the ways of the world. In other words, he, he doesn't have a, a capacity to see evil when he really should. So it's almost like he has a moral um, deficiency in his lack of moral insight, and yet at the end of the story he's being uh, praised for saving a life by exhibiting that lack of moral insight. So there's a paradox there. It's not that he's, you know, the thing, this raises an interesting question because he's not unintelligent, right? Yeah. And he's not, he's right. not a cruel person. Like he's very, he's, he's, I mean, he's he looking, notices. he's looking for the best interpretation that he can make. So yeah, I mean, he is a, he is not, uh, you know, there, you can't really criticize him for uh, anything but, just being obtuse in in his viewpoint, and of course, his racial perceptions are just typical of the era. You know, where it says that he took to Negroes as, as uh, you know, as though he, someone would like a, a uh, a big dog. You know, that they he has this sort of friendly attitude, um, well, he, a Newfoundland he, dog. And that the Negro is basically designed to be a body servant, and uh, he admires that fe feature in Babo. You know, here's this guy who's about to cut the throat of 
his master or his pretended master, Benito Serino, and Adelino is praising him for being such a great body servant. Um, so that it's, well, it's, it's constant it's dramatic a, irony. Well, Caesar, this is the deal. If uh, you're going to, this would be the difficulty. And I think, um, uh, uh, criticizing Melville for whatever, uh, uh, racial proclivities he included in this text because it's you read it one way and he's i guess underestimating the intellect of the the what's the right word negroes that are on on the ship but if he had been a deeply suspicious individual and who had not been so quote-unquote naive and had over overestimated out of an abundance of caution that um these servants were capable of 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 murder i mean would that really sit any better it, it, you know it's like it's kind of i guess what i'm trying to say is is the interpretation of of delano is damned if you do damned if you don't yeah. you know yeah yeah people uh, uh, some critics have thought of him as uh, embodying a particularly a uh, naive form of um, approach to the slavery issue in America at the time. Uh, people who read Uncle Tom's Cabin and sort of sentimentalized uh, Uncle Tom and people like Harriet Beecher Stowe who, who looked at uh, blacks as fundamentally good people who were suffering under this terrible oppression. Um, and... Uh, who uh, were willing to take all of this uh, misery without rebelling against it. And, uh, you know, Melville was kind of giving them a wake-up call that slavery, by definition, is an injustice, and anyone who is in slavery has a right to assert their freedom because it is a corrupt institution. Um, no matter how benign it might see from the outside. Um, so there were you know, plenty of Americans who uh, were incapable of imagining something as horrible as a slave uprising in the North, but in, of course the Southerners lived in constant fear of that kind of... Uh, event, you know, and they had examples in, uh, you know, Nat Turner in 1831 and Denmark Vesey and a whole history of Southern rebellions against slavery. Um, but, uh, you know, nothing, nothing, I mean, I suppose Nat Turner was the last one that was really sent shockwaves through the South, uh, nothing that much closer to Melville. The, it's the slavery issue in Melville's time at the time of the writing of the book had more to do with the rendition of slaves from the north to the south and the increasing um, hatred and um, you know violent disagreement that the northerners and southerners uh, faced when they dealt with the issue of slavery and you know for instance Mel's father-in-law Lemuel Shaw was instrumental in enforcing the fugitive slave law in Boston in the spring of 1851 to uh, send a guy named uh, uh, Anthony Sims, I'm I'm sorry, Thomas Sims back to uh, slavery. And then in 1854, there was a famous um, Burns, Anthony Burns rendition in Boston, which created a huge um, public protest and thousands of people were in the streets um, to uh, protest that event, and uh, that took place, uh, you know, in the same year as Melville wrote this story. Is that was in this May and June of 1854, which was also simultaneously the time when uh, Franklin Pierce was uh, signing the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act, opening up though that territory to uh, slavery, uh, according to the popular will you know and then in that winter 1854-55 was when Melville wrote Benito Serino so a lot of critics have tried to sort of see what 
what exactly were the connections to events of the day. Um, of course, another approach to the story would be that it was Melville's heads up to the United States about the perils of expansionism under Man Manifest Destiny because the issue of the annexation of Cuba had come up. Southerners were really eager to uh, take on Cuba because they were afraid that Spain might liberate it uh, or declare uh, you know, slavery obsolete, just like, as England had abolished slavery in its, in its colonies in 1833. Um, American Southerners were afraid that Cuba was going to um, liberate their slaves and that would be a threat to American slaves. So they wanted Americans, they wanted to buy Cuba, and if they didn't, uh, if they couldn't buy Cuba, they would invade, you know. So there was the famous Ostend Manifesto in October 1854 that was signed by three U.S. diplomats that said that Spain should sell Cuba to the U.S. or else. Um, and so at least one critic has written that uh, the story sort of illustrates the perils of taking on um, the, the, the slave state of Cuba in the same way that Delano is sort of naively assuming control of this slave rebellion on the uh, defunct, uh, the, you know, the, sh the ship, uh, the San Dominic, which shows signs of being a symptom of the old decay of the Spanish Empire in terms of its um, decor and whatnot. So anyway, those are just some political approaches to the story. Yeah, the only thing that I could see, like, I, I guess I cut Melville some slack. It didn't seem to me to be overtly racist in any way. Yeah. Uh, the only, it, it, and if anything, I can see it, it um, being an anti-slavery text. The only way that I would read maybe some pro-slavery take into it was would be to, Say, see, well, look, look at these, these, these slaves. They really are barbarous, and yeah, you got to watch them all the time. But to me, it just says like, if there were no institution of slavery, these horrific circumstances never would have occurred. So let's just not have it. Right. That. Yeah. Uh, that's that's my interpretation. But maybe I'm being naive. Well, I think most contemporary readers would would look at it that way. In fact, there's a. A really great book that came out a couple of years ago of a guy named Gregory Grandin called The Empire of Necessity, which is a very detailed history of the um, the historical background to this whole uh, incident of the slaves who were ta you know bought in Africa, brought into South America, and then shipped up the coast. Um, and it just what it reveals is just the incredible barbarity of of the treatment of these of these people, of uh, these Africans. Um, so if you if you so, want to know yeah. the historical background, that that's a really great book, uh, Empire the Empire of Necessity. He teaches at NYU. Yeah. Um, I mean, why would why wouldn't they revolt? Yeah. You know? Why I mean, if the if the if the tables were turned, yeah, and we revolted, we'd you know we'd be heroes. Yeah. You know. Right, just you know, the American Revolution. They were, uh, you know, rejected the condition of slavery that George the Third had put them into. But um, yeah, the funny thing though is that when Melville adapted his source, uh, which was a mass of Delano's um, narrative of his voyages, uh, he in the narrative that he was this chapter that describes the similar circumstances the it, it's clear that the slaves were more kind of heroically motivated to return to africa because in the in melba's adaptation they're kind of demonized in a way i mean there there really is nothing really that um heroic about them i mean they were all committing these barbaric acts of mutilation or murder uh, on the ship, when you know, this is the all the details that you get in the legal documents at the end of the story. But um, 
there's really little in terms of these were, you know, freedom fighters in the same way that the slaves in the Amistad in 1839, you know, re uh, rebelled and they were, you know, they took over the ship and then it was caught, it was um, um, picked up by the U.S. Coast Guard and then John Quincy Adams successfully defended these slaves for for, um, you know, this was a Spanish ship and they were declared to be free and sent back to Africa. And in the Creole, that that ship was picked up. It was a slaver, illegally slaving, sending slaves. And it was picked up and they, um, by the British, and those slaves were released uh, because of the fact that they were... Um, you know, they were, they were legally assessed in a British uh, Caribbean domain. Um, so in those incidents of those famous uh, slave ship um, uprisings, the, you know, they both ended well for the slaves in terms of their getting what they wanted. And that, that was kind of the model that Melville would have seen if he had read up on the history of, the, you know, this kind of rebellion. Um, but he doesn't do that so much, you know. Yeah. Something I wanted to ask you, uh, doing some of the background research and finding that the the text was not just inspired, but um, emerging out of these actual historical events. How you feel about that as uh, you know, a, as a writer yourself? I mean, were there, there were there charges that Melville was in a way plagiarizing, I mean, or... Yeah, that he, I mean, he's it? rewriting these historical texts to put his own spin on events like this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they, 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 I, I don't know exactly how faith, I'm not versed in the events that happened and to say like how true it is and how much liberty he took with it. Yeah. But to find out after the fact that it was actually... Uh, a, na a naturally occurring historical event, he kind of just like took it from the his history category and put it to the fi into yeah. this novella. And he, you know, well, he wants to reshape he tweaked it. it. Yeah. Well, how do you, how do you feel about that technique? Is that a legitimate way to present? Well, I literature? mean, Melville was always, he always needed a con a concrete inspiration for his work. So it was either, his work is either semi-autobiographical, uh, he mixes his own experience with um, fictional devices, or he takes historical texts and adapts them. But, I mean, Hawthorne did the same thing, and Shakespeare did the same thing. I mean, Shakespeare's histories are basically Tudor propaganda uh, masquerading as drama. I mean, they're great plays, obviously, um, but he's definitely putting a spin on the, his view of history that um, is convenient for the regime that he's writing for, you know, Elizabeth and James. So, uh, I mean, to me, Melville's strength is that he he's a he deals with the tangible historical realities. I mean, he's 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 writing as a romantic, you know, American romantic, but he's 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 sort of taking on the world as a as a documentarian you know he's trying to figure out things and he's using symbolism and allegory which makes ties in with his romantic heritage but um you you learn about the world from reading melville i mean there's he's you you, you get the you know the ugly truth from melville that you get from few other writers in terms of human nature um so you don't think there's anything illegitimate about the way that he went composing this text? No, because it's interesting because the first person who wrote about this, a guy in, um, uh, I think the 1928 or so, or in the 30s, he, I mean, it was known when he published the story, one, one of his critics said, oh yeah, I recognize that's from the chapter 18 of Delano's Voyages. You know, really, it had an historical source, but then when someone looked at the actual text in the 20th century, they 
made a very superficial judgment that Melville had just taken it and made a few adjustments and uh, and passed it off as a work of his own. Uh, whereas he really he made he used it as a source text, but he made you know very pervasive strategic adjustments and inserted things that weren't there and he tailored it to his his own vision uh, even though he was incorporating you know a lot of the information and he took on he took the legal documents and made some some adjustments there but he you know he changed characters adjusted characters because in the original account uh, babo uh, wasn't the guy who was the manservant of Serino. It was Murad, who was his son, yes. who was that, who's completely left out of this, the story. So he, he took this character, Babo, and I was just reading that, you know, it might have been because it suggested the character of Iago, you know, the same kind of sound. Uh, because he isn't a Iago character. He plots the whole thing. He's a great actor. He refuses to speak after he's arrested in the same way that Iago says to everyone, you know, I have no, for, if I can't do anything more, I have no further words for anyone. Um, but I've also been reading that, you know, Babo, if you take a positive view of him as this great revolutionary leader, his silence is kind of like Christ <laughs> at the trial in, in front of Pilate who refuses to, you know, say anything to, to defend himself. Um, <clears throat> So it's odd. I mean, it, it's hard to think of him as a black Christ. I think that the Christ-like suffering is more uh, more applicable to Serino. Um, but um, it is it is interesting the the way that Babu is you know executed and how yeah they're made such a demonstration is made that of that right like. Don't they don't they put his head on a on pike? On a pole, or pike, yeah. And he met yeah. he met the gaze of everyone, you know, kind of directly. He wasn't ashamed or anything. So he was he's kind of <coughs> he hasn't submitted himself at the end, even though his head is on a pole. Um and his body is burnt. Um To me, the way that I interpreted that, I didn't read so much like a Christ like thing into it, because Christ didn't you know, lead a, he didn't lead a uh, physical insurrection. Yeah. It was a spiritual one. But to me, I, I took that as a sign to deference of, of Babu's intellect that the head is sort of preserved in this act of execution, that there was a, there was, that it was deference and respect for the, the plan that Babu had set in order. Cause I bought into it, you know, I fell for it. Yeah. <laughs> had me tricked. Yeah, that's well, the way. That's my interpretation of it. That was that's how I. Well, tell I, me. I, I, I feel like Delano has, or or the our narrator or Melville, you know. I, I I feel like he had respect for Babu. Yeah. Uh, respect just me for the for the ingenuity of his masquerade. Yes, his dramatic yes. talents. Um, yes. Think about like what it would have taken to keep that up. Yeah. Well, what do you what What do you think of the shaving scene and the and the <laughs> you know the fact that it's <clears throat> it's sort of a scene from the Inquisition <clears throat> that uh, he's being um, tortured there, and uh, it's Delano who's who's the interrogator. You know, he's asking you know how come it took you. Uh, <clears throat> two months to sail up from the coast of Chile that only took me a few days. So he's trying to get to the heart of the matter right. <coughs> when he's there on the <laughs> rack. And then, of course, Babo gives him a cut yeah. um, to give him a little warning that he, that he can't even hint at the truth of the matter. Right, because it'll, it'll, it'll blow the cover. Yeah. Um, of course, it, I mean, I it suits the gothic um, atmosphere of the story. You know, gothic fiction often featured. I think what I think what resonated. You know, yeah. I mentioned before that I mean, what what I really enjoyed about that scene was seeing it from two different perspectives. 
seeing it first, being kind of naive and thinking about it, it was just kind of like uh, uh, business as usual barbershop visit. Uh, and then seeing again, <laughs> like, like, like you just described it as being a, a weird form of reverse torture where yeah. I'm going to punish you if you do speak. Um, the, the, the imagery that jumped out to me the most, which was not only was the, uh, you know, kind of feeling the lethalness of the blade and, and imagining myself in the position of Sereno. But um, I, I thought what was very important was the role that the flag played in that scene. Right. Yeah. Cause does it, it was used, cause, um, uh, used as a, a sort of a towel to wrap them around. So sort of disrespect of the flag. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Delano at first he's like he can't understand like why he's draping him in the Spanish flag and, and <clears throat> he that that Babu must be just uh, just amused by the colors of the flag and not really even understand what flags mean. But yeah. then you like if you can appreciate the subtlety of of his mind, then then it it takes on a whole different <laughs> other level that he's prepared to shed blood on this Spanish flag, you know? Um, yeah. I thought that was, I, I really liked the way that Melville uh, brought the flag into this barbershop scene. I, I, I think it's, a, I just think that's a genius idea. Yeah. Um, I've never, I've, I don't think I've ever seen or heard of anyone doing anything like that. The, is there, is there some kind of precedent for that kind of, uh, literary <laughs> idea uh, does it have a history i don't know was it, but was the, it calling back to something the only other famous shaving scene in melville of course is at the end of the confidence man when the uh the old man goes in and has a shave and um uh with the uh, i'm sorry the cosmopolitan goes to the uh to have a shave in in, in a penultimate scene and and effectively cheats the barber uh, and it has a very spooky atmosphere, but it's not it's not the barber in that scene who is the uh, dangerous character. It's more the the cosmopolitan confidence man who is who is there to perform a petty um, deceit <clears throat> of getting a free shave. But it also the shaving scene also makes me think of the scene in the chapter in Moby Dick called the line when he talks about how all the whale men are in this whale boat surrounded by these lines that are playing back and forth very quickly when especially when they harpoon the whale the line plays out and you know if you get near it you could potentially get um caught up in the line and pulled out of the boat and he has this uh mm -hmm. description at the end saying you know all men are, are surrounded by whale lines all of us live in the uh potential of sudden death um, that, that we are just kind of a, a, a step away from uh, sudden death. Uh, it's, it's a very effective image about, you know, how perilous our lives are. You know, we, we can be fine, you know, one second and then have a heart attack or be in a car accident or uh, have someone, uh, uh, you know, who God knows what, you know, die a sudden death somehow, but people actually, you know, obviously if you're in a whale boat, you're, you know the peril that surrounds you, but he's implying that everyone is living in a condition of suspended um, <laughs> animation, you know, that we, we face death at any second and we never know when it's coming. So that, yeah. it sort of ties in with that motif of the shaving scene and the whole charade with uh, Babo, but obviously the that story casts that motif in a in a in a in a you know very different setting in terms of its politics and history it's interesting you bring up Moby Dick here because something that was great about Moby Dick was the attention to detail to the physiology of the whales and the bones and yeah um, the process of processing whales. Yeah. And we see a little bit of that here, but not with whales. We see that with the skeleton um, of the skeleton on the mass. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering what struck you because there's uh, some critics think that he was cannibalized. I mean, he, the, the story says that he was 
killed and then taken below and then three days later his skeleton emerged and that's Serino cannot say anything about it it's so horrific you know so the some theory is that uh, the, 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 the rebellious slaves cannibalized him or that Serino himself was forced to eat his own friend's flesh um, I don't know if we can draw any conclusions. I, you know, I, I, it, I'd have to might, look into that more. But or or both or both. I when I when they described uh, hewing down to the bone or whatever uh, with the skeleton, um, the only reason I could think that you would do that, w- I mean, to me, I mean, immediately came to mind was was cannibalism. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, well, the main is, fact, it says that the, I, the interesting question would be to me if it was in fact uh, cannibalism, if this was done as the result of some sort of retributive um, religious practice or something like that, or if this was done out of necessity um, for being lost being being at sea for so long i think that would really be the only question is if yeah well the the emphasis for the the blacks and whites on the ship is the lack of water i mean the water is the thing that is um the pressing issue in fact it says that several sailors went crazy because of lack of water and jumped off the ship it doesn't say necessarily that their their food supplies have run drastically short but on the other hand, that may be a given. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, basically they were, uh, Babo was trying to sort of create a, a terroristic intimidation for the sailors saying, uh, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't follow our command. So he, um, uh, it was a sort of a coercion technique um and uh you know i don't know um do you yeah. do you know if there's anything in the historical record of uh western sailors um committing cannibalism out of necessity at all i mean would would well would yeah they, would that have ever been an option well yeah there was a famous um story of uh you know that was based on the uh, the as the sinking of the Essex by the uh, whale in 1819. You know the story of the Essex, which Melville read when it was written up by the mate um, Owen Chase, um, and the a whole story of the survival of the sinking of that ship from a whale, uh, a male uh, whale banging it, you know, sinking it. Uh, led to horrific cannibalism of, you know, people in uh, there were I think there were three whale boats that sh- that um, uh, set off from the Essex after it sank, and then at least two of them I think committed were were uh, had to commit cannibalism. So I mean it was a pretty frequent issue in naval narratives in the early nineteenth century. It's interesting how, um, if if memory serves me correctly, I mean, I read it about three weeks ago, so I'm trying to recall here. But doesn't doesn't Delano make a big deal about making sure that his men get Christian burials? Who whose men? Do, doesn't Delano do, doesn't he go on and on about that? Getting about well, what, sh- which men are you talking about? The any men who were killed when they're assaulting? Just that's. Just at sea in general, I think when he, I think he recounts how when he first started, he had experiences where he lost men at sea or, or something to that effect. And then he learned from that and he wanted to make sure that everyone got a proper burial. <laughs> wasn't there, I, don't wasn't there a bit? I, I think, yeah, the only thing, am I, thing that, am I making that up or is am I getting that from something else? I, I don't think it's part of the story necessarily. What he, what he's doing is when he gets the men to, assault the ship he's offering them prize money he says there's plenty of gold on the ship on the saint dominic um but uh there's not much in terms of burial uh 
Well, I just I, I just finished another text that may uh, maybe clouding <laughs> my judgment. I, I just finished um, uh, Bernal Diaz's The Conquest of New Spain. So maybe maybe I'm yeah. mixing up my yeah, stories. Yeah. No, so, I don't think that's an issue. But um, I'm so I'm sorry. I I don't. Sometimes I just read so much. Sometimes <laughs> I get the wires crossed. Um, but there are plenty of sailors who were thrown off the ship of the uh, of the um, San Dominic. You know, who were during the rebellion. Uh, the legal papers talk about just how some of them were stabbed, some of them thrown off. Um, it was just kind of a crazy massacre, whether you drown or you were stabbed to death when the, when the original uprising took place. Um, so, well, yeah, we have so much still to talk about here. Um, did you want to talk about, did we address all the historical background that would be relevant to understanding this text. I mean, we kind of touched on it in our conversation, but I didn't know if we left anything out that you wanted to draw people's attention towards. Um, I think, uh, I think the major issue of course is the years, you know, after the compromise of 1850, 1854 is when he wrote the story. And that's when I think Melville is really waking up politically because just like other people in the country, he's seeing the drift towards secession at that point. And he's seeing just how, you know, dangerous uh, it's becoming to allow the South to uh, get more um, power. Uh, by, you know, say the kansas Nebraska Act, uh, abrogating the um, Missouri Compromise, you know, the fact that you weren't supposed to have slavery above a certain parallel. Um, so I think he, Melville is being politicized at that point, which would make uh, sense in terms of a story about slavery at this point. Um, <clears throat> but um, we don't really know. I mean, we, we don't have a day-to-day record about what he was reading uh, we know that, I mean, he, he read Putnam's Magazine because he was, that's where his work appeared. He had, he probably read Harper's uh, Monthly Magazine because that's where his work appeared. He read the New York Herald, uh, the, the newspaper. He probably read um, papers from Albany. Um, but we ha- we don't have a really good record in terms of uh, what he was thinking at this point in his career. I mean, he was pretty much, he was struggling to, make money as a writer. Um, he tried to publish a novel in the spring of 1854, um, and uh, he couldn't get it published. So he, you know, at this point he was surviving on short fiction, which, you know, he got the ho- pretty good rate uh, for a writer, but it's, it was nowhere near enough to support himself and, and pay his debts as a, as a writer. Um, so... So, yeah, I think that probably adequately gives us the context for that. So one of the things that I came across is that people were talking about this as being um, uh, a, a good example of an unreliable narrator. Yeah. Um, what, what can you say about that as far as a narrative technique and how Melville employs <clears throat> it and it's ingenuity or yeah um well i guess you know you you would call it a a limited omniscient narrator um who is uh i mean he's you know the narrator is is having to walk a fine line between um entering Delano's thoughts and then saying things that are outside of his thoughts because we are in two thirds of the story. We're in Delano's mind. Right. And, uh, he's looking around trying to figure out what's going on. And then, um, we are, uh, you know, given the final exposure in the beginning of the third part of the story. Um, but, I mean, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't call the narrator unreliable. I think he's just um, terminally aware of you know the the difficulty of separating illusion from reality, uh, appearance and reality. I mean, this story is just exploring the the difficulty of grasping the truth of of something. Uh, right. Penetrating to the truth. Where do you where right. do you get to the truth? I I use the ex- expression unreliable narrator because I didn't really know what else to to call it. And I like how did you how did you distill it? You said a limited a limited omniscient, omniscient. Narrator. yeah yeah yeah. That's a I like that. I like that's better. That's better. Yeah, I I like that. Did did you come up with that or is that like no, a that's, thing in that's comparative standard? Literature? You know, omniscient, limited omniscient, third person, first person. I mean, this is third person, obviously. Uh, well, yeah. But, I'm still learning a great deal about literature from you, so I don't, I don't have this uh, background in all yeah. the different types of narrators. Um, but it is. Uh, some people complained about the structure of the story in terms of the legal documents. That one of his readers, uh, a guy named uh, Curtis, who, who was eager to publish the story, he was a reader for Putnam's Magazine, and he. He uh, he advocated for Melville for the story, but he was very annoyed by the legal documents. He thought Melville should have worked them into the story, um, in into the narrative somehow, instead of having them sort of end up as a sort of this aggregated glop at the end of the story that <laughs> is is just this sort of dry legal description. But on the other hand. Um, you know, like any court document that chronicles a horrific crime, you 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 just are. No matter how dry it is, it's still very evocative. The more dry it is, the more you know shocking it is when you read it. Um, do you think? Do you think that's a sign that Melville was rushed with this at all? That he kind of threw it in at the end. Well, no, I th- I don't think he. Well, that's a good question. He. Uh, he was he was turning out work at a pretty rapid pace but i don't think i think he would not have done that unless he thought it was the best way to um conclude the story um it's interesting that you know his two brothers were lawyers so he he knew all about what it was like to read and write a legal brief. Um, so I, I think the the ending of the story, of course, you know, the story ends with a little dramatic scene between um, Delano and, and Benito Signorino where they talk about, you know, how come you're not over this again? Can't you, can't you get over what happened to you? Delano is wondering why B- Serino is still in a funk about this horrific tragedy and of course Delano is is sort of telling him to move on and of course Serino I think of, you know he's suffering like PTSD he he just can't change himself overnight he says you know the mm. shadow that hangs over me is the negro you know which you assume is babo at first but then could be the darkness you know for the spanish word for negro um, That's, you know that that raises yeah, it an reminds, interesting. Yeah, it reminds you, of course, raises... of reminds you of the, bar, the end of Bartleby, right? With Bartleby is uh, the narrator is telling Bartleby to you know cheer up because he's in the prison and there's grass growing and the blue sky overhead and <laughs> and Bartleby yeah. refuses to be cheered and of course dies shortly thereafter of self starvation and Serino himself he he dies of I guess some kind of psychosomatic illness because uh, he's a young man he's only 25 in the in the uh, historical record this this raises an interesting question you know you use the word PTSD to apply to Serino and you know that came into kind of our collective lexicon I guess after the after like the Iraq war yeah uh, but start talking about troops coming home with PTSD and I guess in Vietnam they people they talked about people being um having flashbacks yeah and I, all the way back to World War 1 I, I guess they was people on 
Yeah. We're calling PTSD things like a shell shock. Yeah, right, exactly. What, um did did there was there was there a name for this sort of condition? Psychological rea- condition or reaction like in the 19th were, century? Did, uh, yeah, yeah. Um no, there there really wasn't. In fact, you know, Civil War soldiers came home with what was obviously this same kind of condition and uh they were just treated as invalids who uh, were just, you know, needed rest and care and um, nurturing and family environments, but there was no, there was no sense of any kind of uh, psychological illness from, from the the exposure to horrific scenes. Uh, I can't think if I, because you and I've done a lot of work on the Civil War. You've, you're a great historian in that respect, and I've done some on my own and i can't remember i mean you you're obviously you would be an authority to ask on this i can't really remember if there's much in regards to cinema or plays or literature that really explores that psychological condition in civil war civil war s- s- soldiers and it would seem like they would have suffered from it more than anybody because yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so because, brutal. I mean, they were hacking off. I mean, you had to, you, people were getting their arms and stuff like that cut off yeah. so to avoid gangrene and stuff. Like, I, you know, it it traumatizes me just reading about it. You know? Yeah. Has Has anyone effectively written about that? Oh yeah, or, there there are lots of good uh, books about the medical history of the war. But, oh yeah. Um, Is there any, no one that you could recommend? Is that well? Kind of. I could, not offhand. But yes, it's it's uh, it's remarkable to think how long it's taken to put a, a an official medical label on a condition you would think would be obvious from from modern war. Although I guess it would it would date from kind of the Civil War and the advance of technology and in the ways that uh, you could you know destroy people and blow them up and. Um, uh, but anyway, just to get back to our book. Sure, um, sure. I just thought it was an interesting, interesting aside. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the story ends, and you know, you Bab- uh, Serino dies of what? What's his illness? I don't know. He dies of of just depression and misery. I mean, it seems as though he's in the convent. You know, he's in this monastery, uh, withdrawn, and. Um, uh, so he's, he's, you know, he's shows what for Melville, you know, you can, you can blithely ignore evil, but if you face it too, uh, uh, too directly, it will kill you. It's almost like the, the myth of the Gorgon. Uh, you know, if you see right. evil directly, it is so shattering that you're, you're going to die from it. Uh, you can only look at it, you know, sort of like Perseus and the, uh, you know, with a sideways with a mirror, um, or else it will kill you. I guess Melville's idea is that you know, people same thing in Moby Dick and the uh, and the whiteness of the whale. You know, you will you will go blind if you look at the at the snow. Uh, you know, the ambiguity of the universe, the whiteness of the whale, too mu- too directly. Uh, people can't face too much truth. Um, and something else that T.S. Eliot said. Uh, so it, I think it ties in with that idea that, uh, you know, the the world is a horrific place if we look too closely at it. And in a way, we should all be a little bit like Delano and, and not looking too closely at, at the reality. It, it sort of saves our, our soul from uh, contamination. Um, anyway, it's a, it's an idea that Melville obsessed about. All of his work is somehow involved with the, the the factor of evil, either cosmic or human. You know, so. I mean, I completely understand. I understand why people build blinding paradigms so that they don't have to confront uh, very uncomfortable truths about the world. Uh, but at the same time, I think that personally, I find that it that moral to be an infantilizing one, but 
Maybe I have not been uh, staring into the abyss like I should, or to, yeah. to truly understand that. Yeah. I, well, I, I guess it's most it's I, mostly traumatized people who who have that point of view. Melville, of course, uh, you know, lost his father at the age of twelve and lost his brother when he was in his twenties, and you know, he saw death close up repeatedly, and he lost family members to it. And um, I think he uh, he was scarred by that experience. Right. Well, um, uh, we we're probably out of time, right? Well, no, I, I mean, we could keep talking. I'm uh, I'm not up against a hard break. I mean, yeah. we we have kind of meandered a little bit more in this conversation. That's largely my fault. I apologize <laughs> to everyone, but uh, my mind gets a little squirrely sometimes. Um, we, I don't know if we touched too much on. We could talk about some uh, of the uh, literary influences and and analogs. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we talk? A, why don't we uh why don't we close out with that yeah well of course the two writers who are regularly invoked are hawthorne and and poe um hawthorne uh was melville's great model for his short fiction he borrowed from him uh, you know left and right uh, a lot of his stories show obvious borrowings from other stories in this case um um the uh uh, similarities are to Mar my kinsman Major Molyneux, which is an early Hawthorne story about a young man who goes to Boston and is walking around and doesn't realize that his famous kinsman, who's in the government of uh, the colony, um, the colonial administration, that that evening they're going to tar and feather his, his relative, uh, Major Molyneux, and that everyone... Uh, kind of puts on a charade that they don't know, you know, where his relative is, or they have all kinds of uh, non-answers to his inqu inquiries about um, uh, the relative. And so, you know, his name is Robin, and he's in town. He's kind of an archetypal, uh, naive young man. And the final scene of the story is when this parade of rebellious Bostonians comes along with his uncle, with his relative, I don't, it's not his uncle, I guess, it's his kinsman, um, covered in tars and feathers, uh, which was the treatment of um, protest for uh, the colonial administration, you know, rebelling against the powers that, that are in control. And uh, the last scene of the story is of a guy asking Robin whether he is ready to join the rebellious colonists against the power of his kinsmen as a British administrator. Uh, so it's a less brutal uh, story, but it still has the same structure of... Uh, Two th three quarters or so of the story involving a person who's completely m misled about a situation of violence and then suddenly has a revelation about what's really going on um, and is asked to choose sides, you know, whether he's going to be with the colonists or whether he's going to be with the British authorities. Um, but, um, and then for Poe, uh, <clears throat> there's an interesting analog in, say, the house of fall of the House of Usher, where Roderick Usher is, you know, living in this bizarre uh, seclusion with his sick sister, and the narrator goes to visit him and doesn't know what's going on. He spends days with him and can't figure out um, <clears throat> what's wrong with Usher. Uh, he tries to sort of hang out with him and get the full story, but he never does until the very end when. You know, they buried his sister, and his sister comes back to haunt Usher and embraces him and then collapses. And the whole house collapses after that, after the narrator, you know, barely makes it out alive. Um, there's also uh, a story of Dr. Tar, Dr. Feather, about a lunatic asylum. And asylum guys visiting a lunatic asylum where the, the inmates are in charge. They've rebelled. Um... And uh, so, 
you have some models that Melville could have looked to in terms of the structure of the story, in terms of the, the reversal of normal order and the dramatic ironies that emerge from a sustained description of a visitor to some place where everything is mysterious and not uh, the way it's supposed to be until, you know, the final moment of insight takes place towards the end of the story. Um, so he didn't, he didn't have to look far for potential models, uh, but none of these are, you know, closely parallel to the story, this particular story, in terms of its theme of slavery. Well, I think that's very helpful information trying to contextualize this. I feel like, I feel like we could talk about this book a lot more. And yeah. I feel like they're probably, maybe if you very quickly could say something about the critical literature that surrounds yeah. this text. If you, because though it's a very sh short piece, um, I'm just kind of feeling after this conversation that we're still just kind of scraping the surface of it. I feel like there's a lot yeah. more going on with it uh, on a spiritual level, on a sociological level. On th there's, there seems to be a lot more to this book, and I imagine people have spilt a lot of ink talking about it. Is there anything? Yeah. Is there anybody you would recommend so that people can go check it out for well, further reading? Definitely, Greg Grandin's book, uh, "The Empire of Necessity," um, from a couple of years ago. That gives a, an exhaustive historical background to the story. Um, there's also a very good book of Eric Sunquist called "To Wake the Nations," which is about the development of African-American literature and literature about African-Americans in the 19th century uh, came out in the 90s, I think. Um, I looked in, when I looked at online in the JSTOR, there, I, I was surprised that there weren't as many articles as I thought there'd be. There were like 64 articles listed, but of course, they're probably about twice that number uh, if you look at everything that's been published in terms of articles, but then that doesn't include book chapters. So the question of race, of course, is a big issue in Melville studies as it is in, in, in other literary figures. So <clears throat> you do have a constant stream of, of work trying to figure out Melville's racial thinking. Um, and generally people are recognized that um, you know, Melville had a pretty progressive view of, of race, and um, this story is not the sort of an example of, of a stereotypical view of African Americans the way some people read it in the 1950s. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's still inspiring a, a stream of interesting critical work. Um, and uh, one of the last articles I read was about how the language that Delano uses in terms of his complaint about the incivility, the, the, the lack of social grace that Benito Serena shows him, that he doesn't do use the customary manners that he should, um, echoes some of the language from white writers, I, I'm sorry, from northern uh, white writers talking about the South, that, you know, we should try to keep civility between us as we discuss racial issues in the mid-1850s. Of course, it was harder and harder to do that because people's um, attitudes were becoming so frayed and, you know, Southerners were getting more and more violent about their need to secede. Uh, so you had, you know, the caning of Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate uh, by um, the nephew of, uh, by, by Preston Brooks, uh, who was the, uh, a nephew of the, of the individual, the Southern Senator that um, Sumner was attacking. Um, um, so, anyway, <clears throat> there's plenty of, plenty of material out there. Um, well, I'll say, I, I hadn't heard of this text before we got the request for it. And then you lit up when I said, hey, what about doing this? It does seem to 
have quite an enthusiastic following. Yeah. People seem to be pretty passionate about this particular one. I've, I don't think we touched on this, but it's included in a, in a set of tales, right? Do I have this correct? The, the Piazza, Piazza tales? Piazza tales. Yeah. Yeah. Bartleby, Bartleby and, uh, and Benito Serino, they were tales that were published in Putnam's magazine. And so he, he collected them together and published them in 1856. Of course, he didn't make any money off that. There and were like five the, of them. In, weren't there five yeah. in there? Well, five or six. There was a, the preface was called The Piazza, which is a story in itself. And um, so, yeah, but Bartleby and Benito Serino are regularly uh, read by college students as, a, as the pair of Melville's best short stories. Of course, you know, well, many more of his stories are really great, but they, they are the most representative of his work as, as a writer of short fiction. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed it, and I yeah. really enjoyed this conversation. Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I surveyed a lot of the online discussions or whatever. There weren't many. Yeah. So again, I think we've done a little bit of pioneering here. There were some the majority of the presentations that I could find online in audio and video format uh, for for this topic were limited. Although I did find a really wonderful um, radio drama. Oh yeah, um, yeah, that was done in the late '90s. Have you heard that? It, it's incredible. I have They're, they're um, Robert Lowell, the the poet, uh, wrote a, a dramatic version of the story. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that was, if that was what you heard. Um, uh, but he made it a very, very pro, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, freedom of the slaves. It was a kind of liberationist, um, text that reflected the spirit of rebellion of the 1960s. Um, yeah. I think, I think there's a movie as well, but I didn't get a chance to see it. Have you seen it? No. No, no, I don't. I don't uh, know much about other versions of the story, but I should. No, yeah. Hey, well, thank you, Doctor yeah. Cook. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and let's be in touch okay. to talk about what we might want to cover next. Okay. I know uh, you have a busy teaching schedule, so maybe something that fits with your yeah current curriculum. Yes, I will. I will be in touch. All right, thank you. Okay, we'll see you. Bye bye.